we are here today on the Creative Underground, and I am very happy and privileged to have here today with us uh, Dan McCaw. Uh, he is one of my uh, personal favorite painters, and uh, I enjoy uh, having him here and maybe even being able to pick his brain a little bit on some of the things that he's discovered in, in a lifetime full of paintings, of wonderful paintings. So, uh, Dan, hello. Hello, good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> and, um, Dan, I, I, you know, uh, most people know who you are because you, you do have a good name. Um, and you also have uh, two sons that we'll talk about at the end of the broadcast that paint along with you. Uh, which is a real uh, neat aspect to your life as a painter. Um, but I was wondering if you could tell the painter just a little bit about yourself. And uh... Well, I'm probably the same as most painters out there, probably insecure. And uh, I have to fight for the life of every painting I do. I was raised in Butte, Montana, kind of an Irish Catholic mining town, which really didn't offer me any art opportunities, so I wasn't taught in school. So when I was, I think I was 19, no, I was 20, I left um, Butte. I went to actually uh, the Montana School of Mines to college, and uh, it was an engineering school, which I had no business in being in, and I wasn't interested in that. Either. So after just playing some football for them and walking the halls of, of the school, I, uh, I left there and went to San Francisco to the Academy of Art at that time. I think it's the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. And my, uh, I did what most people went through the academics and drawing perspective, and the whole, the whole uh, ball of box there, and then because of run, I ran out of money. I was married, and I uh, had one child, and I moved to Los Angeles to get a job. I was an illustrator and a design, Bill Franz and associate, a design firm. And from there, I furthered my education by going to the Art Center College of Design. And later was asked to be an instructor there, which I was uh, for around 15 years, I believe it was. And uh, sometimes on a full-time, sometimes part-time, doing illustration, going to school, doing um, other workshops, just to further my own artistic endeavors. And I really was probably disillusioned with the illustration end of it. Um, I, was, I didn't like to be told what to, what to paint and how to paint it. And, um, not necessarily how to paint it, but just they had a certain uh, thing that they needed to sell their product. And I, I felt kind of restricted doing that. So I kept working my way into the fine art end of it and, and finally was exhibiting in some galleries. And, and that's kind of where I began my art career. It's been just a, it's been a journey of just learning. I mean, that's, I think what it's all about anyway, is that we constantly remain curious, open-minded, and uh, vulnerable. And I think that's what brings us through this, is uh, frustration. Yeah. And, and, uh, there's, there's no real cut path, or they, they don't give you like an art school or, or anywhere, there's there's no like, hey, you do this, that, and the other thing. And um, sometimes I, I find it frustrating. People think they want to be an artist, and they just think that you put on the hat and go, and it's, it's all there. But uh, it, it isn't uh, an easy path, and historically, it hasn't been an easy path for any painter uh, to make a, a life in art. You know, it's a lot of timing and persistence, and that you have to, you know, passion is about believing in something so strongly you're willing to walk through the flame to get to the other side. Mm -hmm. If you hold your hand, I paraphrase, in the flame long enough, a flower will blossom. 
And I think a lot of that is true. You have to be willing to endure a lot of frustration in order to hopefully arrive at some point it changes. I think that, I think art and your direction and your influences and your experiences all contribute to this momentum that carries you through life. I, I think you need frustration. If frustration is a driving force of creativity. And I think when we, um, well, you know, where I think fear is the thing that holds us back from most things. I think fear of failure, humiliation, rejection stops us from doing many, many things. And until the fear of never changing outweighs the fear of failure, we remain stuck in the same spot. We, we become familiar, even if we, even if we don't like the position of where we're at, because we're there long enough, familiarity leads some security. And so we may just like where we're at, but until we're dissatisfied enough, we will move on. So I think much of art is, I think it's very in stages of art. First of all, you're, you're amazed at just trying to, to depict something that looks like something. You go to school and you learn the fundamentals of drawing perspective. And you, uh, you become enamored with trying to make those things look more like the thing you're looking at. Your drawing or painting look more like the thing you're looking at. And that can be a lifelong struggle and uh, seduction for many people. I see that, I think it's kind of a double-edged sword in a sense that that once we start down that path, we become kind of enamored with our own skill that we're getting better and better and better. But for me, it didn't really fulfill everything uh, about myself. I, I would, there was a, certainly a certain amount of satisfaction in doing something that looked like something. My skill was getting better. But there was always something missing. And I thought it's my skill, so I tried to make it better, better, better. Then it was still missing. And I think it was because at no point did I search to allow myself or struggle to allow myself into that piece of art. And I, and I mean by that is that um, as, a, as a young artist, I used to try to depict what was in front of me. I tried to pick more uh, things that were maybe better looking models or better scenery or whatever it might be. But it was, uh, it was always kind of a, a surface type of involvement with things. If I could make it look like that, then that was the end result. Uh, as I grow older, it's more not, I think as a young artist, you look what's in front of you and you try to bring it in. Mm -hmm. Or, I think as I mature, it's what's inside me I want to bring out. So that search is different, and that search is not determined by the likeness of what you're looking at, but by the feeling that something in you grabs you. And now I paint, and I don't know when I'm going to be finished with the painting. I don't know where it's even going to go. It's kind of, I trust, I get on the ship, and it's a ship without a rudder. I let it take me wherever it's going to go. I don't try to force my intention, my original intention, into that painting. Meaning, I start out with an idea, and no matter what, I'm going to complete that idea. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not restricted by that anymore. So I just let it um, develop. If I need a shape change, I'll, I'll change it. I think, I, I, I might, go back to this uh, point where I think it all begins, the creative process. I think as a child, we, we were very creative. We try new things, we're amazed at everything. And if we, if we do something, we, what do we do? We look for somebody to acknowledge us. And usually, you know, it's our mother or the caretaker or whoever father. But let, let's say generally it's, it's our mother. And if we don't see that reaction, what do we do? We change until we do get a reaction out of it. And I think that follows just kind of through life. I think 
by third grade, when Johnny or Mary is, is um, praised for painting the tree trunk brown and the leaves green, all of a sudden my purple tree loses its value. And so I take and I start to hide some of those things in order to be validated, to fit in, to be recognized. We do it in society, we do it in, in uh, relationships, we do it in jobs, we do it in school. And we hide through our journey through life, we hide a lot of the things that are our true nature, or closer to our own, our own heart. And um, I think art allows us, to, as we, at least for me, and again, all of this is about just how I think about it, my own philosophy. No, I feel strongly about it too. The same, everything you're saying is like you're talking right to me. You're like the guy I need to listen to because <laughs> the thing is like right on target. I mean, I was the only one here in the room. <laughs> That's good enough for me because everything you say is perfect. I mean, yeah, well, I appreciate that. I, sometimes you never know uh, your feelings and your philosophy or how it, uh, if anybody else has it even. And I think that, yeah, right. um, I think art allows us, at least as I get older, I see it that allowing me to search for some of those things I've lost. And you say, well, how do you find those things? For me, it's those things that grab you at gut level. So I don't, I don't think art gives you anything that you don't already own. And what I mean by that is you can go to the museum and I can go with a friend and I can be moved by a painting and he doesn't hardly notice it. And it's different for everybody and it's different things that we appreciate and things that move us at different times in our life based on our experiences and our perception of those experiences. I, I think basically life is pretty abstract. It's our perception we place on an event that makes it our own, our reality. You could be exhilarated flying in an airplane. I could be terrified. The event's the same. It's just our perceptions are different. So as an artist, we're trying to, I, I feel that I've always tried to broaden my perception of things. So again, some people think of a, rainy day is very cold and depressing. Other people see it as beautiful reflections and, and clear sounds and whatever it might be. And I think each event has those options within it. If we broaden our perceptions, then we can pick those things that are closer to our own true nature. So um, a, lot, a lot of things revert back to, I, I guess, uh, even a, even a Childhood, people say, oh, he has, the child has a great imagination. And, you know, our imagination is only from our experiences and our perception of those experiences. So they're very, they're kind of very limited for a child, actually. But what they have is they're not reality based yet. They, they make free association. So they know there's cows and they know there's airplanes. So a cow can fly. And so the uh, dogs can talk, and uh, so they they're not limited. We then become kind of uh, we're faced with reality, and we eliminate some of those things in our thinking. And I think that's really I think we have to go back and start to make free associations and things. I think yeah, the, more. The, the, we we learn so much that actually shuts down that that freshness. That you're talking about that a child has that they they're able to just look and experience and perceive and however their mind tells them to do that but as we grow older we we learn oh the grass should be green the sky should be blue that's correct and everybody puts all these things on us and then we start working towards that i i'm i've been painting all my life and um i feel like i'm just starting to turn the corner to what you said because with my painting, I've, I've been painting a lot of things about what I thought the world should be, to make other people happy. And, uh, you know, like you said, this grocery list of detail, things like that, uh, make it, trying to make it uh, real and all that. But I've just been able to go back to some of the things I did in high school and younger and start painting my feelings and my thoughts, the things that I've actually steered away from almost my whole career, I'm, I'm starting to look at that and finding that that is really me and 
the most natural thing for me to paint is um, my perception, even if no one else gets it. And, you know, we've been conditioned, like I said, to believe that we should be a certain weight, a certain height, we should drive a certain car, we should have a certain amount of money. So I think the things that we give up, as, as I said, you know, in order to fit in, to be validated, to be recognized, I think those create, those things we bury and sometimes we even forget that we have, we're, we are reminded of those things when something grabs us at a gut level. And I think we own those things. Those are just brought to the surface. Just like I said with, with painting, with seeing a piece of art that moves us. And, and it can be anything. It can be a day. It can be somebody you need. It can be what, whatever. We have all these inputs that we have to trust our instincts with, our, our feelings. And that's how, basically, that's how I paint now. I paint until something moves. And that may be way past the object's likeness. And so I, I start out, and I let that intuition take over. I, do, I keep going, scraping, painting, uh, whatever I have to do in order to find that. And I don't find it all the time. I set the painting aside, and then maybe two or three paintings down the road, I said, oh, there's a solution for that. So I allow that freedom of, uh, of uh, my intuition. And, and, and I think sometimes, as artists, we feel if something isn't done within a certain amount of time, it's a failure. And I don't believe that. I, I, I set it aside. And it has to wait for its time. And sometimes my mind, my subconscious is working on that problem that I don't know about. I divorce myself with trying to literally consciously solve a problem when it's when I I run into a roadblock. So I let kind of it sit and put it out of my conscious mind and I think the subconscious is trying to figure this all out. And so um, my process has changed, my perception has changed when I you know I have five children and nine grandchildren. So in the my journey of an artist it was also to make a living for them, you know, to, to uh, get them to school and dentists and take care of my family. So I now paint with my two sons that paint in our same studio here. And um, they have been my teachers. They bring this youth and they bring excitement and they bring curiosity and it stimulates my uh, my own perception of things it broadens my perception because they bring things I wouldn't have looked at, and I I think people are more creative than they think. I think they're more whole than they think, and uh, I think it's I think painting allows us to search for those things if we allow ourselves. You know, we'll we'll be what we allow ourselves to be, and that's that, that's. You know, each person is different. Some people are very daring. Some people are very, you know, to please other people uh, is important to them more than taking a chance. And, uh, you know, there's an old saying that you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too, too much room. And I think somewhat, we have to be willing to fall on our face, and get up and try something again. And, when I have my two sons here, which will probably be coming through the door anytime, but they, we encourage each other. It's just, you know, the creativity sometimes just takes a breath of encouragement to raise its wings. And I remember as a little kid, if somebody came to my house and, and said, oh, I love your cat drawing, I'd run and find every cat drawing that I've ever drew. And then I'd get paper and start drawing more cats because it's that, it's that validation that we need to push creativity, to push us to, uh, to believe in ourselves. And I think, I think, when I look at art that's out there, I think, I learn a lot from everything. Right. I think the value of a piece of art that I do is not that it sells, but that I learn something from it. And that I'm open-minded and I'll change things. And I don't, I don't become as, I used to, if I found something in a painting that was that was done well, that I thought was pretty good, 
I would sacrifice the rest of the painting in order to preserve that. And the rest of the painting probably sucked, you know. So now, uh, because of my kids, and seeing John, who's my oldest son, that's the more abstract, he'll give up something that's really needing the painting in order to make the whole painting better. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I'm constantly learning from them. And I think if I did a work, I used to do workshops, okay, we do this, we put a model up and then we go through the basic, the basic uh, fundamentals of comparing and uh, color harmonies. And, uh, and they're, they're, those are valid principles, you know, proportion of active to passive. Of, for, for me now, and even then, I think I was strongly influenced by uh, people that uh, were not so formal orientated, they were more pattern oriented, shape oriented. And I was influenced tremendously by, um, by the illustrators in the 60s, Mark English, who still admires the painter. There was like Bernie Fuchs and Robert Heinberg and a group of the illustrators there that that were more shape oriented uh, than that the kind of I was attracted to, more so than the form painters. But I, I was influenced by everybody, uh, you know, from May to the German Expressionist to the Tapies, the Spanish Abstract, and to everything was, was exciting to me and still, still is, fortunately. And I think, I think sometimes certain uh, styles of art become uh, like a religion. They don't want to look anywhere else because that may dismantle something they believed in uh, for so long. So they kind, of, kind of restrict the perception of art. And I think you constantly have to be going out looking at things. And again, it's, it's not that you like a piece of art or don't like it, it's that it creates a conversation within you and helps define your own taste, your own perception. But I, I, that's Danny and John when I go out with them. They open my eyes to look a little harder at some things that maybe I would have just passed over. And by doing that, it gives me more of a vocabulary, vocabulary to have a richer language with. with. And like I said before, and some of you know, you know, some languages we know, and some we have to learn. And that's, uh, I think it's, uh, it drives us as artists to keep us fresh and keep us excited and keep us surprised. And those are the things that I think everybody has to be stimulated with. You know, to, to repeat the same thing over and over again is safe, familiar, and predictable. And, it, and it, we have control of it. We have, to, we have to take some chances. We have to see that there's, there's more in us than I think we really realize. These, these are, you know, very mature concepts that you're talking about. And, you know, um, and, you know, I could see that for some people, they might be hard to understand. And for other people, they totally can get it. But, um, you know, uh, there's a couple of things um, that you talked about I thought are important. Uh, everything you said was very important. But uh, that, uh, like, you talked about experience. Um, I'm, I'm reading about Thomas Hart Benton right now. He's one of my painters that I like. And uh, he had a very stubborn nature and um, he didn't have a perfect life, but he, he did magnificent art. And he believed that experience was the most important thing. And that's why he wanted to get out and have different experiences. But you could have experiences at home and you're having experiences in your studio. But as long as we have experiences, you know, that's what we can paint. And um, versus, you know, like you're saying, just painting things that you see, you're, you're trying to grab deep inside and, and find something. But there's this constant battle in our brain that's going on. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's a battle with ourselves. Maybe it's the battle of, you know, the public acceptance, uh, parental acceptance. I don't know why we, we go through this battle, but um, I know that when I cut up to one of your paintings and, and I see, I've seen them in person and on the internet, that I love your paint. 
I look at that paint and the medium of paint has such a sophistication to it that I haven't seen with any other painter. I mean, there's beautiful brush strokes different artists do and, and some of them, at, at, maybe as you said, that um, they get into this one kind of mode and they create this one certain look of paintings and they've kind of stopped exploring. But what I most admire about you is that you've never stopped exploring. You've never stopped to evaluate and allow yourself to come through in your paintings. And you see that in the paint. And I, I'd, I'd like you to somehow explain, if you could, <laughs> what happens with your paint when you're painting? I don't, I don't even know how to ask that question. I, I think, you know, I look at uh, as many paintings as I can. I'm always curious about them. And I, I appreciate and see the tremendous talent that's out there. The technical skill of some people is amazing. You know, and I and I can be drawn into that and and uh, like anything I my temperament is not to sit and I was at a an artist friend's studio the other day and he spends months on paintings my temperament is not that you know I see people and I used to go out painting outside I did all the things which I which I can't dismiss as as, as those things that got me to the point where I'm at right now, whether it be just like you said, all the influences, all my fears, everything is wrapped up into when I approach a painting, whether I know it or not. And so, uh, my, my my probably the process that I paint with is I paint kind of where I'm not a thin painter. I don't build up with thin layers and then come into the thicker. I, I almost want to see an immediate reaction and I, the weight of the paint, the thickness of the paint. There was a, a paint I used to use and uh, they couldn't make it. It was a thick, almost like peanut butter. And now uh, I, have, I have bought some new paint in gallon cans and and it was just, it was like soup getting it out. It was just runny. So I had to take and add whiting into it to make it thick so I could push it onto the canvas and move it around where when things were thin and very delicate, it was so sensitive. I, I wanted to get the impact of paint. It just felt good to paint something down. I could scrape it off. I could be aggressive with it. Most of my things that are done on canvas are first I stretch my, my stretcher bars and I put a piece of glue on down and then I stretch the canvas over that. So I can be aggressive with sanding, scraping, kicking it, whatever, whatever it happens to, to uh, come to mind. And I'll try all those things. You know, I'm like somebody that's on a sinking ship. I'll first see if the lifeboats are there and if there's no lifeboats, then I'll see if there's life jackets. And then if there's no live facts, eventually I'll see if I, a shoe will float, you know. So I'll try anything to reach that point of something moves me. So, so what are you responding to when, like, let's say that you're sanding down through the surfaces of a couple layers of paint or more than that, whatever. And I, and I know it's all artistic as far as what you leave, it's, don't leave. But how do you, what, when does it click with your brain like, that's what I like? It's a feeling. You have to trust that intrinsic feeling. That's why most people or a lot of people don't like abstract art because they can't define it. They can't, uh, they can't see a story or they can't uh, tell what the object is. They, don't, they may like it, but they don't trust their instinct to say it doesn't have to be defined. It just has to move. Me. And I think that's more there's just certain feelings probably if i blindfolded you and gave you a rock one being smooth and one being sharp and angular and said which one do you like best and you said well i i don't know and i said well what if you had to pick one what would you pick one's heavier one's lighter one's sharper and i think you'd probably start to say well you know what maybe i like this angular one better and i i think it's kind of like that in painting i just I just keep going in the painting until something feels right to me. And I can look at I can look at rust stains on a wall and that moves me as much as something I see in a museum. I can just stimulate something within me. And I 
I think if more people trusted some of those things, it would bring them into their pain. Yeah, we, we disregard those things. The things that are speaking to us, we try to disregard those, and those are the things probably we should be listening to stronger. Right, a good example, I was with Danny and John, my two sons in New York, and I was photographing. See, I, I, my personality isn't to set up an easel outside and spend the whole day painting on the scene. Mine is to go up an alley to see a shadow, to see textures, to walk around, and then I'm, I'm thinking, what's around the next block? You know, so I'm constantly moving in and out of things, trying to find, just being open-minded and curious, and trying to find those things that are exciting to me, or that move me, or that's, and I'm, I'm surprised by some things that I would have never thought of that all of a sudden stimulated my imagination. Well, I was walking down there looking at the buildings and shooting shadows that fire escapes made. And I looked down, and John, my oldest son, was shooting cracks in the sidewalk. And all of a sudden, I realized I was stepping over all these treasures and didn't notice them. <laughs> I think, again, it's the perception we have. You know, all these things are happening around us. Right. It's, how many things do we pass by each day that we don't perceive? And so all this is, all this, I used to take a my class and say, all these things are happening around you. How many sounds have you heard in the last minute that we can just disregard? Or how many, if you turn your perception towards something, if you say, I want to see all the different doorknobs that are on the street, then all of a sudden your awareness starts to broaden, you start to become concentrated on a particular thing, and you see the value in it. So how many things like that are we missing that we don't uh, we don't perceive as a value? So I, I think it's about taking your kids out, taking yourself out, and just be have that mindset of a child. Be amazed, try to be amazed at everything. And and from that you may take back things that whatever period you are in your life that may be of value to you and that you can use in a pain or that may stimulate it. I go to um, I go to uh, some of these art fairs and look. I was at Basel, with Danny and John, and we were looking at the contemporary art scene. A lot of things uh, in there uh, stimulated my imagination. Not that I necessarily liked them as a complete thing, but I thought, wow, what if I that turns me on to an idea? You know, and that's what it's about. It's about like we probably talked about before, is it's like me telling you a joke, and that reminds you of a joke, and you tell me that another joke, and that reminds, and that's how creativity leverages itself out. I, mean, I think it's all out there. We just have to open ourselves up to it. And we, we become comfortable in the safe, predictable, and familiar, but we don't want to leave that because we're afraid of failure, rejection, humiliation. So something has to move us, something has to move us. Yeah, it's like almost like we're taught a certain way to perceive reality. And I don't know this sounds way out there for some people, but it's like we've been taught a way to perceive reality. And there's really many ways to perceive reality. And we have this imposed reality on us, and then we think we're supposed to interpret our art that way. And it's not only the art, it's we have per perception of what we should be, like I said, how tall we should be. How much you should weigh, that you should have this education, or and it, we're all fed that through advertising. That in order to be happy, we have to have all these things. Yet we we deny those things that are truly maybe our own because we're afraid they'll be rejected. I think every person has an essence, a thing that makes you know essences. Those elements or things that make that thing what it is. And with, without some of those elements, it's can't really be completed. And I think the things that we give up uh, in order to be validated, in order to, I think we, uh, uh, we have to search for those missing things to make the essence of who we are. And I think we've been conditioned to believe that maybe some of those things are because we don't have enough money, or that we are not like I say, thin enough, or that we don't have enough power, or that. And when we when we go after those things and they don't 
fulfill, fulfill us, then we think it's maybe we need more of those things because it's we've been we've been kind of propaganda the propaganda says that we need to in order to be happy. And so I think if at a certain point, the frustration builds in a lot of people. And if they don't have the uh, education or the facility to make money, to do the things, then they become frustrated enough for maybe they turn to drugs or they turn to alcohol or something to kind of suppress the frustration. And I think the whole thing is it's those things, that, those intrinsic things that we're missing, those things that a purple tree, you know, when we were six years old, that we, or by third grade, that we were kid. And it's just kind of my philosophy about frustration and, and where people are in their in their lives and how they search to maybe feel complete or they're missing something. And I think art is a way of, uh, for me, of finding some of those missing to express myself and. And everybody wants to, you know, eventually look in the mirror and see themselves, not to, to pretend to, you know, how he pretended to be somebody else in order to fit in. So, do, do you feel like your paintings are kind of a mirror for you in that sense? When you're painting, you look into the painting, you see the mirror? More and more, I think that they are. When I did a series of these kind of frozen figures, it's probably a couple of I yeah, I wanted you to maybe if you could ex even explain one of those a little bit, if you could possibly, or what was going through your mind more. Not, I don't know. How are you going to best explain it? Yeah, they just um, they just felt right. So I started doing them, and I kept doing them, and kept doing them. They could have been influenced by a lot of different people that maybe I looked at their art and it kind of again it was something that I felt I owned. They were just maybe exposing it. So I started to do these figures. And I then, you know, it was kind of like a little kid throwing a rock through a window. And then you take them and you try to analyze, why did you throw that rock through the window? And then you, you kind of, that's what I kind of did. I did these figures and I thought, why am I painting these figures frozen? My own self, analyzing myself, I thought, you know, I see a lot of people stand, myself probably is what it was, self-portraits of standing with your arms frozen at your side, waiting for somebody to validate you. You know, we never really truly reach our full potential if we're so frozen out of fear of failure, rejection, that we never really try to find and express who we really are. So those were, a series and I still paint those I, and I mean something in that sense I, I eliminate the faces because even how many how many people do we really know even how much of ourselves do we really know so sure. it's kind of that search we all put on a facade and put on a suit or present this image of ourselves so underneath is probably a lot different than we're trying to Perceive what other people expect of us to be, and how, I think um, how does that paint that like the one that's standing tall figure uh, behind you on your right side? Um, how does the paint work with those thoughts? How does how does it just kind of resonate in your mind when you're painting that the abstract and I guess the thought? How do they commingle to? Say that's the way to do it. Yeah, I think I start out, for me, the aesthetically, design and value are probably the two most important things for me in the painting. And if I can get my design working, that's that's the key. You know, and there's a whole theory I have on design of proportions of active to passive. Uh, um, dynamics of a painting. You know, we, we're working always between contrasts. Um, what I mean by that is everything has an opposite, up to down, black to white. Without the opposite, we wouldn't have any dynamics. We wouldn't have any life to something. If there wasn't a, a long a straight line, we wouldn't have a curved line. So. As artists, we're, we're just illusionists, so we try to play those things against each other. 
I, if I relate it to something in life, which I, which I really relate a lot of pain directly to life. I mean, the same things are uh, intermingled. Uh, for instance, in painting, well, let, let's take it light. The good girl is attracted to the bad guy because there's a tremendous amount of dynamics there. Nothing of one is contained in the other. But there's also a tremendous amount of tension, and that hardly lasts. So what happens, one tries to make the other a little bit more like them. And so that's what happens in painting, the red against green. In order to harmonize, we need to take a little of the red and add a little of the green to it, a little of the green and add a little red. But what happens if we keep adding that to make it more comfortable, more familiar, we get them so close to each other that there's no dynamics, they've lost their identity. So what we have to do, as the master said it, they still harmonize, but they still contain their own identity. The green still feels like green, maybe gray down around the red still feels like red, but they, now they harmonize together. And that's the same way I think the relationship is that It's allowing the other person to be still who they are, if there's a harmony between you, because you do contain some of the other. I don't know if that makes sense to you. <laughs> no, it does. Uh, um, you know, I've heard it said before that um, that, that the artist is actually a, ahead of what is happening in our culture, where the poets, uh, where the voice of what's going on in our culture. Um, what I think that's true. I think uh, I think some of the artists that are, what's being right. done is always pushing the edge. You know, they're always out there uh, shoving something that maybe you don't want to recognize in your face, but it's, it's truly there, whether it be societies and justices or whatever it might whatever it might be. And there are those artists that take on and that becomes their cause where other artists are trying to mimic what the past artists have, have done. You know, they, they can look like more like a sergeant or a lawyer or whatever it might be. Um, and that's their criteria because those people have already been validated. They can make it close to theirs and it's, that validates them, or at least they yeah. drive you, you don't want to succeed too early in your painting life because then you'll be stuck doing that. This is kind of like in songs in the music industry that, uh, what is it, the one song wonder, and then they can never break that the rest of their life. They're mm -hmm. stuck to that song. Mm -hmm. Kind of like in painting, you don't want to find your path too early because you're going to get pigeonholed. Yeah. And, and to be a, a, a true painter, you have to constantly break what you've done in the past and move on to the next step. And, well, and, you know, I think each person at different times of their career, they have to do whatever it is that makes them feel like a painter, like an artist. And so that may be some people have to paint directly from life or they don't feel like an artist. Some people have to paint from just sketches or out of their head. Some people have to go outdoors and paint. Some people have to do one thing or another. And, and I, I believe that the diversity of art is what makes it so beautiful. That there are people that, that are doing technically beautiful things that are stories. And, and my, I try not to limit myself to just the, those artists that represent a story or define an object, but I try to broaden my perception of things that surprise me. That's what I'm attracted to, things that surprise me, that stretch my own imagination, that keep me excited and curious. And, and I think most people, if they're placed in an environment where that is supported, they start to find they have much more to offer. I mean, I, I feel I'm just, I'm, I feel I'm still controlled by fear and by wanting to be accepted. And, validated. I still think that's that's in part of me. And I think there are those artists that are willing and those those pull us along, the artists that have taken chances, that have risked things, that have broken what society deems acceptable at that time. And, and those people are the ones that drive us to try something new. They're the ones that are, uh, that are kind of uh, trails new trails. It's, 
you know, society, there's a lot of things in society right now that, uh, that you complain about. I'm not necessarily about what's happening in society as much as what's happening inside me. How do I find that thing that's in me that I've given up in order to be validated and fit in? So my art is just a personal journey and some people are like it and some things I do, I, I don't know about. I'm, I'm self-doubting, I'm insecure. I fight for the life of every painting that I do. I don't know if it's good or bad. Usually people know and have judged a lot of it the validation of the painting if it sells. You know? And I think that can be, I think sometimes a lot of the general public is, is buying things that are very, uh, it's kind of the lowest common denominator but that's okay too if it excites them and that is their life and whatever. Well, as artists, you know, we have to uh, or need to sometimes uh, market ourselves. Um, how, how do you how do you go about? You know, you're coming up with new ideas and, and you've been successful at it and and presenting new ideas through your life and and have people accept them and, and want to you know come on board with your paintings out. What, what do you think's a, a good direction you can give to somebody that, I know all artists always looking for ways to market these things, but what would you tell that? Uh, I think you have to find those galleries and people that like what you're doing, not trying to find new things that you think they're going to like. And I, I painted for a long time in a, an arena that liked that I mean, I painted a lot of paintings that were sentimental and and, uh, and appealing to a lot of people, and I made a living at that. Uh, but I w woke up and I thought, "Gee, I've been painting this for ten years. I made a living, and of course, I was very aware that I had to make a living, you know. And uh, but now it's more about." Uh, Painting more of who you are and finding the, the uh, audience for that. Going to galleries that maybe appreciate that direction. Because there's, I mean, there's every range of art you know, out there that's, you know, that's right. being sold. You know? um, I don't think you can, you can stop your own process uh, and wait for the public to catch up with you or the galleries that you're in. Because I think I think a lot of galleries don't want them to show anything that they don't identify with, and I, I don't blame them for that. I just think you you can't remain doing that stuff in order to satisfy them at the expense of your own your own growth. And uh, it's all about curiosity, persistence. Uh, excitement, surprises that keep you in this game, you know, keep you going. Otherwise, you do the same thing over and over and over again, and you get better and better and better at it, skillfully. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think all the things that I learned, the basic fundamentals of composition and uh, anatomy and uh, proportions, uh, and I was, I also was trained by two really good teachers, one was by the name of Don Putnam, who was one of those people that uh, had a tremendous facility. I looked at it again, I was amazed at it. It made me want to have a better facility. And then, really, who kind of taught me the procedure of painting was uh, Sergei Bonaparte, the Russian painter. And so we went through that academic discipline of painting and still on black and white for me and doing like, you know, constantly comparing you know what's the red to red what's the warmest red the coolest red what's that and all that and that thing it's in the fundamentals of it and it isn't to reject any of that but i believe learning the, the rudimentary tools are like learning to drive a car the whole thing is about learning to drive a car, it's about that you learn enough that you take the car on a journey. And it has to be your own journey. And that's not a not a path that's been predetermined by everybody. 
And you know, whoever you were like when you were young were like malleable pieces of clay. Anybody who exerts pressure on us starts to form who we are. And I think that happens through life depending how insecure we are. And I'd say I was probably insecure and probably still am, you know, and that's why I'm huddled down here in my studio and, uh, and do what I do and uh, you know, I'm, I'm still probably controlled by a lot of those things that, that as a child I was controlled by. And each person is different and I learn from each person and I try to see how it fits with me. And, I appreciate, I love abstract, I love expressionism, I love, I love traditional art. I, I, I find something of value in everything. Maybe that's from my mother. She, she saw beauty in every darn thing. She, Maybe you should find something you hate, huh? You should find something you really dislike or even if you hate. Mad or <laughs> but I think it's value even in things that you hate or dislike. That may change too with your broadening your perception, but even there, it creates a conversation within yourself. And it's all about that. It's if we ask ourselves good questions, we get good answers. And it's finding those good questions that we ask ourselves that we get the, the best answers from. And it's really, uh, it's really teaching yourself, you know, to be curious and read and. and uh, you know, I started to do all this exploration later in my life. I was I was kind of doing this stuff like like I just said don't do, which was making a living, being more concerned about that, finding something that everybody liked, and just keep doing it. And that is, I was not completing that essence there were things left out and still are that and maybe you never put it together but maybe we're as artists we're searching we're using the tools to search uh, in a better in a better uh, environment than if we're thinking we fulfill ourselves by the more materialistic things we do the more power we do. so it, it's really uh, it's not just about art per se, it's about, it's about us and the journey and how do we figure it all out, each one be an individual. It's, um, it's an amazing thing and that I can work with my two sons. You, you should have us all on once on time. And yeah, well, that's interesting yeah. dynamics, yeah. We used to on Friday have some drinks and we'd start to record it and you know, by the end, the third thing, <laughs> we got some other first. Well, that would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, we'll do that. I guess we're, we're both searching for some of those unfinable things. And you know, all art doesn't have to be defined. You don't have to look at it and say, oh, yeah, there's a story, there's an intent. I can see the intent. I'm led to a this conclusion that the artist wanted me to arrive at. Some of the art is I have to participate in. It. You know, I have to wonder what is it. And then my imagination starts to trigger it. And I see different things and probably different, much different than the artist even intended, but they're my own then. I own that painting more than if somebody directs me through, even though I might sit there and be amazed at the facility. The paintings that move me are the ones that I leave and I can't get out of my head. You know, it's like going to a movie and, and seeing something that explains everything and has drama and comedy and you leave and you can explain everything and it's good maybe or whatever. Or you go to one that you leave and it's still in your guts, you know, three or four days later, you still, it still left you with this emotion inside you. And I think that's kind of where a painting has to go and sometimes you don't know where that's going to lead you you just have to trust that it can happen and that you search for it you have to have faith that somewhere in that this this journey this this uh, uh, this thing on canvas will show you something of yourself and you have to fight for it you have to be willing to scrape something off and paint over and let it dry and cuss it out this conversation is constantly 
you're asking is too big, is it too small, is it a texture, um, uh, too much to it, so is the painting too dark, or too light, you know, you're constantly uh, having a conversation, even though you see the artists uh, silently struggling with this, there's there's a constant conversation, going on. you know, even the, even how the brush feels against the canvas, or the the spatula or whatever you're using or your hand, sometimes I just feel like I take my hand and grab a bunch of paint and just smear it on there. It, it feels good. I feel more like an artist that way than doing a number painting, you know. Yeah. It's, just, it's just me. It, it, I, can, can you like, um, like I can look back on a, a painting and it's almost like I have a recording in my head of that whole painting. I remember the experiences and the yeah. thoughts of the painting when I painted it. It's like you, you just can't even shake it if you wanted to. This. Or you can yeah. think back to a painting and the experience. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I can see that. I mean, they, are, they are an experience. They are something that we're trying to bring out of ourselves. And, and you know, I, I'm critical. Anything that's around my studio, I have hundreds of paintings that are laying around with at different stages, and all. depending where my own temperament is that day or that attitude, I'll go through some and say, oh, I think I can solve this differently. I've got enough of them there. If I really want to do something, I can just send this. So I'm willing to do that, especially if something stimulates me uh, to do that. If I go somewhere to a show or whatever, I think, you know what, that's what I should have been doing in this point. So I'll come home with that and, and uh, try it. Try it. And from that, I might fail, and then I scrape the that painting. And oh yeah, maybe something comes out of the scrape. And all of a sudden, it starts to take on a little bit of a course of its own, a life of its own. The so painting. I don't know to happen. The painting behind you, on uh, to your left behind you, it it, it has. Yeah. Figure yeah. that's very yes has a figure that's very obvious in the shadow. Um, it's kind of the figure against the shadow in a sense. Um, it really makes me think what's going on in that shadow. It's almost like there's importance or unknown or confusion or I don't know what what is that dark shadow? What what, what does that represent to you? I, I don't want to leave you with. This is uh, probably a design element more than anything else. It was probably a portion of something against that was very active. I needed something simple in there. And it was more about tasting, you know, you feel, you know it needs a little more salt, I think. You no, know, too much salt. And I add something else. That's how the painting is for me. I, I allow myself the freedom to change anything. That may have ended up in a land, to be a landscape that I've gone on with. It, you know, it might have just been. I didn't, you know, I was, like I say, I'm a ship without a rudder. I'm just, whatever the wind blows that day, I let it be that. Instead of trying to, well, I need a face, and it's got to be a pretty face. And I've got to have uh, this baby you look like she's 17 years old. I, I don't care about that, you know. I care about, does it move me? Does it, does it, is it a, I basically, in paintings that are more ambiguous, I basically, open a door to a room and if you wish to enter that room what you find inside then you will and that's that's how i feel what you find out of this painting will be personal to you but if i define everything if I lead you oh, yeah. <laughs> then i then i'm uh, then i've done i've served myself but it might not be anything too other than the skill of doing it and I appreciate that skill, and sometimes I think, am I just lazy that I don't, <laughs> you know, that I don't want to paint a face? So I paint a face, and it looks, it just doesn't fit into me. And I, I've taken many faces on my face, and well, I don't. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's more like reading a book. You can envision what you want to envision. You can think about what you want to think, and it makes it more personal. But when you see a movie, everything's kind of defined, so it can't be something else. Yeah, yeah, defines too much of it. But one painting can tell you as much as a whole novel. 
you know, it can right. move you in that direction as much as a whole book take, you know, pages in the book take to, to do arrive at that. So a lot of it is kind of symbolism, you know, that I give you a symbol and then you you attach your face to it. Do you attach? Is that you? Is that your whoever? Is it your wife? Is it your mother? Is it your kids? And so I don't, I don't give you everything you know, because then I've taken a lot of your interpretation, your engagement out of it. You just, I just look at some paintings and think, God, that's skillful. Everything's there. And then I leave and I forget that painting. But other ones, I mean, I can be as moved to seeing just the brush stroke of a Hans Klein as I can with as a, as a sergeant, you know, for different reasons. But they both, all those, all the different paintings also are doing the same thing. They're trying to move emotion in us. They're trying to, and it was the emotion I see that he painted it with. I see the, Portions of the brush stroke, the thickness of that against the, the texture, against the uh, flat areas. Again, it's all, you know, we're illusionists. It's all playing those proportions against one another. Which to gray, I want cool. I want something straight, I put some curve next to it. I want something bright, I put some gray next to it. So knowing those fundamental things just gives us a broader language in which to to express the things. And if we can keep broadening that language, we can keep changing our perception of things. You know? And that's that's really what it's about. And it's, again, going back to the children, to be able to make free associations, to put things together that normally we wouldn't put together, surprises us, engages us. And uh, so that's what I'm trying to do in my art now. And it's, you know, I, I think, I think, oh, okay, I'm, being lazy with some of my art. You know? So I've got to look and search. And, and why I feel, feel that way is I look at other people's art, I think, well, they weren't very lazy. <laughs> they were pretty ambitious at this point. So it makes me think, man, i got to get going. Well, you know, I, I've heard with the programmers that the best programmers are the laziest programmers because they only put in what the code <laughs> <laughs> and they leave all the rest of the stuff out, but that yeah. makes them the best. Yeah. Well, even being, you know, even once you're, you know, creativity has a way of diminishing itself. Once I think, you know, I could paint anything any way I want. It's like saying to you, you can take a trip anywhere you want. Right. And you say, well, you know what, I think I'm going to go to Paris. And that leaves out Rome. So all of a sudden, we start to narrow down the, Yes. The, uh, There's no criteria like it. You can't say, well, a real painting takes 40 hours. Yeah. Or it, it could take five seconds or five minutes. I mean, yeah. there's no criteria that define. Though people try to think of it that way. They're like, oh, how long did that take you? You know, like, you know, that there's some magical answer that then it's a painting, but it, and, and I think even for the artist, we set that criteria, you know, if it isn't done, if, it, if I haven't been successful in my mind with this painting after a certain period of time, I feel it's a bomb or a rejection. And I don't believe that. So I think people, when I look at a lot of art, I think you just have to keep pushing it on, pushing it on. You know? And I see that it, made the tree look like a tree and the bushes in the pond that they have, but it's lacking. And a lot of students used to come to me when I was teaching and say, what do you think's wrong? And technically there was nothing wrong. And I said, I don't see any of you in this painting. And at some point in painting, we have to fight our way into this. Otherwise we're seduced by what we're looking at so much that we have to you know, shut ourselves out. We allow the technical skill to be there, but where do we interject ourselves into this? Where do we interpret things differently? Where do we exaggerate or eliminate? And, and I think that's, um, those are the tools, I think, to be taught, you know, in, in school too, as we progress, not only to develop one thing in skill, but how do we take that? And how do we learn to drive the car? And then where do we want to drive this car? And 
how often do we go off the main road? How often do we just take a, I mean, one thing I love to do in the city is just get lost and you know, wander up and down different streets that I never would have seen before. You know? And uh, by doing that, I do the same thing in the painting. I let it wander and try different things. I scrape it, it doesn't work. I go back and forth. And, and sometimes I leave, probably 80% of the time I leave frustrated. But I believe the frustration is, like I said, the integral part of creativity. It's the thing that moves us off, off of uh, what we normally accept and do. And so that uh, it's a byproduct. Creativity is a byproduct of frustration. You need to change. Right. You you have a book also, and uh, I um uh, I read it and I got a lot out of it and. Uh, there's so many things we could talk about, um, but I guess it'd be easier if they just went and bought your book. Yeah, I think you can't buy it anymore. It's uh, went through three printings and it's out of it's out of print. And I've been contacted to redo it. I own now the copyrights. And the first thing I would do is change. I fought with the editor on that to change the title of that book. I mean, I thought it was egotistical. It said proven. Yeah, it's, it's a it's 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 a lovely book. I mean. But one of the things that you said in the book that I like, talk, going back to frustration, is that you said that you should find at least 10% of something you like in every painting you paint. And I like that comment because sometimes I get at the place and I'm just like, man, I just hate that painting. I hate that painting. I want to throw this one away and this one isn't. But if you could just find 10% that you like, well, I could maybe find 10%. And... Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those paintings are the paintings you'll take chances on. You know, th those are the ones you want to keep and you want to settle on them dry and then you scrape on your paint. You'll take chances on them. Right. A lot of times, I used to teach. I'd say, you know, you sometimes have to start paintings at a certain point that. Um, uh, where you thought they were, where you've left off, continue at that point where you hate that painting. Continue, let it dry or whatever, because certain times you get so much paint on there, it just, it's it's not manageable. So I'll scrape it or sand it or, or, or let it dry and then sand it and paint back into it. So sometimes just technically the painting isn't receptive to what you want to do. But if you'll take a painting and by side. I think it's a bomb. Most paintings are the ones you'll take the greatest chances on. You know, you'll risk anything. Right. To try. And then you'll, you'll try things because it doesn't mean anything to you. You've evaluated it enough that you'll try anything. They're really important, those paintings. So what I used to say is, you know, we all begin a painting almost, as, or I do, painting maybe the same way. And then we dislike it and we throw it away. Then we start the next painting and we do it the same way. It's like holding, it's like holding your breath and seeing how far you can run. Mm -hmm. And then the next time you hold your breath, start at the same point and run to that same, like the same distance instead of then taking a breath and running from there. So that's what I mean by taking that painting that you hate, that you, but the problem is you want to get rid of those so quickly that you don't have to carry that image home with you at night because you're <laughs> so frustrated and down. It's like you're, you know, if you do a good painting, you can go out and wreck your car and you'll still feel good, you know. Uh, so we, we relate a lot. It's so personal, our, that we relate a lot of, I do, I relate a lot of my feelings are about how well I did today with the art. Uh, so those ones that uh, hang around and you look over and they're constantly telling you about artists, you, know, you want to turn them around at least for a certain time. Yeah, I think you said it earlier that you, you know, and I guess the way I'll explain it is that, um, you know, there comes this part of the painting that you like and then you almost sacrifice the whole rest of the painting to no, exactly. keep the part that you like. And instead, I think, you know, that we have to constantly be willing to give up the whole painting at every stroke of the painting. Yeah. 
to exactly. be able to move forward. Otherwise, we're always like, well, I don't want to hurt this part. Or I don't want, you know, it's, you have to always be able to, you know, jump off that building and hope, you know, the parachute will open. Type yeah, thing. yeah. Yeah, much of it is just that, like you say, jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. <laughs> and I'll figure it out on the way down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you, you have to, and I think the more that you do that, the more comfortable you become with doing that, you know, that especially if you have a lot of paintings in process, in progress, that you can, you can take a chance on a painting. You know, you have to psychologically trick yourself and saying, I can change this. And if you do it enough times and say, hey, the results came out better, you're trying to condition yourself that, hey, I can do this. I can change it. I can get back to this. But um, again, it's, it's, it all depends on kind of what temperament you show up that day in the studio. You might be angry or fearful or, or whatever, depressed or happy or and so some days you'll take some great chances. Other days you're like a little mouse hiding in the corner. I, I feel sometimes uh, uh, like when I come to a painting that I was in a different mood the day before and then I'm in a different mood now and I'm coming at it the second day, I almost feel like I'm not the, the right person for this painting because I'm, exactly. I don't feel that way. I have a quite, another question for you. If, have you ever had a painting that just seemed to paint itself? Yeah, those are the best ones when I just become an observer. And that's really trusting your instinct. You just paint, just keep painting, and you just watch yourself paint. You know, you step back and you just you just trust that intuition. If something feels right, you know what? I think this head would look better as a as a tree. And you just or a shape. Or, I, I'm really shape oriented. You know, I I just move shapes around until so, until uh, they feel right to me, you know, it's like mer moving furniture around in a room. You know, oh, no, that doesn't look right there. I'm changing over here, and that's that's kind of what I do. And so something that balance that that uh, I don't mean balance where I have equal amounts of black against equal amounts of white, but I mean there's that balance between proportions of active to passive, which to gray, which leads to curves. And it's finding that working within some of those of those elements that I find, oh yeah, that feels right to me. And it's more about this trust in the feeling than it is anything else. I mean, I paint now more just purely about instinct and feeling. And I think if more people who did that, they would break out of their their uh, seductiveness to just the object itself. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people spend their whole life just perfecting that skill. And right. If that's what makes them feel like an artist, and, uh, and I appreciate what they do. And I think that's, uh, that's great. I, I just feel I'm kind of an explorer, and if all I do is go up the same mountain over and over and over again, it's not very exciting to me. You have to be excited. You know, like I said before, Passion is about being willing to hold your hand in that flame long enough that a flower blossoms. And, and that's really, um, that's what it's about, I think, is to, to keep excited, keep curious, keep open minded and vulnerable. And I think uh, by doing that, you have to constantly keep stimulating that uh, yourself for frustration to make it own. Is, is there a way that, because I've had a couple paintings that have, have painted themselves and they end up being some of your favorite paintings, but um, is it, and I've had paintings that I, you know, really like uh, that I've created, but it, it is a certain mindset and, uh, and I don't always get into that right mindset. No, we're and searching for that. Have you, have you found anything that helps you better or more easily get into that mindset than not? Yeah, I do know how to get into it. And for $5, I'll tell you how. <laughs> I, yeah, I look for that in every painting. You know, I, I, I struggle to find that point when that painting takes over itself. And more and more by trusting your own instinct, by 
be willing to change things, be willing to make free associations, to say, you know what, something here would look better than something else. I'm going to try it. And by doing that, it starts to develop that, um, that sense of pain and being able to pain itself. It, it, I look for that, some much more than others. It's all like you said, you can't come in and everything's aligned right. Your temperament, your subject matter, the, the design starts to work, whatever it might be, all those combinations seem to come together. It's, um, I can't directly access that. You know, it's that feeling again, I don't know what's going to move me at a gut level. You know, I don't know those pieces that I've lost, that I've given up, that I've hidden in order to be validated, fit in, like we talked about earlier. I don't know what those pieces are until something tells me, hey, that moves me. You know, that, that, that thing in this painting feels right. You know? and so that's what I look for. I'm kind of just blindly searching a lot of times, trying this, trying that, scraping. I mean, I go through, maybe the paintings in the end look, oh, they were effortless, they really weren't. You know, I was sweating blood. And, uh, you know, I, I struggle, I can say, for every, every time I do. I'm not, I don't think, at least for myself, I don't think I have any more talent than anybody I've ever taught. I think it's just persistence. And I think there's a drive in me to find something, some of the tools that I, I know, how do I use those? How do I incorporate them into this painting? What language, how rich can this, Part, where's the richest part of an idea? You know, is it, you know, if you think of a train model, is it when they're stopping the train? Is it when they're robbing the people? Is it when they're running with the money? What's the richest part of this, this idea? And that's what I, I start with an idea. You know, all my ideas are great, and then they become something along the way that it's like, by the time they get on the camera. So, a lot of paintings are not kind of what I intended, but just what happens in this, this journey. I let, it, I let it happen more often. And I find by doing that, more of my subconscious part of me takes over. And that's probably when I feel more like a painter than or an artist. Than, than, uh, just, uh, just when we, we allow ourselves to, uh, or tell ourselves to get out of the way, yeah, we, we'll be what we allow ourselves to be in the end. And, uh, and it's finding what are those things that move us to another level? What, what drives our creativity? What broadens our perception? What, you know, makes us, um, makes us who we should be, you know? And, and whether we ever reach that or not, but I think that's, that's the, quest is to find our full potential, to find at least as much of it as we can within this time period we have. We're like, we're like this uh, completeness, and, uh, or maybe yeah. it's, it's yes. the answers, the answers to, you know, why are we here type thing. Well, yeah. What What do you think the artist's legacy is? What? How do you feel about, I guess, I never, I never think of that. You know, I think about the most important things to me are um, are my family. That's probably the most important. We have a close, close family, and I think seeing them achieve things, and if it was because I maybe like my two sons, and I have three daughters, and uh, you know, I work here with my sons, and seeing them achieve things doing things better than what I do um, is, is really, uh, it's also, it's not only uh, a real sense of gratitude that I've done and uh, you know, made a good enough living to have this type of building and studio and have my kids there and that they're teaching me something and they're keeping me excited. And I sometimes think of artists that have to struggle through this themselves, uh, this all self-doubt and frustration. And you know, you know they, they find the energy maybe by going to workshops or the classes or whatever, where there's some dynamics and energy and sharing. 
And probably Facebook in some sense is, is that it allows a person that's struggling with a painting to put their painting up. And for the most part, people say, I love that. I, it's, like, it's like saying, it's like saying I, yeah. yeah, all those likes and oh, you're wonderful. I know. I mean, maybe I do that for ego things too. But maybe, you know, I did it to develop initially an audience that maybe wanted to buy a book, a new book of mine or something, or if I come out with a book or something. I'd rather them <laughs> almost say something nasty or they hate it or, you know, what they find wrong with it. I, because I just, I don't know. Then it would maybe you know, react to. <laughs> well, I think that, that those still, that's those compliments are the same as when you were young when the person complimented your cat drawings and it encourages you to continue. Otherwise it can, it's a fragile thing, you know. People can be destroyed by a word of, and I, I think if you're going to err on something, it should be on the positive side of encouragement. Whenever I taught uh, painting, it was more about not telling them they did something wrong other than offering them maybe other ways of looking, or seeing, or perceiving something. And, and I've never known a person to want to intentionally do a bad painting. You know? And it's again, it's art is subjective, but I can see where some people are struggling in the beginning their art career and, and uh, I think encouragement is an essential thing to keep them, keep them going because it, there's a tremendous amount of frustration and if you're not you know encouraged I think you fade and die yeah I I've uh I'm, I'm probably wired a little different than you but uh, I have um and and I do get encouragement here and there um and I know there's those people that I don't look for encouragement from because they, even though they might be close to me, because you know they're not going to give me any. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there, but I think more for me, uh, you know, I play tennis, and I play my best tennis when I'm mad. Like you smash a ball at my face, I might get a little mad about that and want to play a little harder tennis and do a couple more putaways. And I think I'm a little bit more like that with my artwork, I respond, I get more energy out of uh, maybe something negative, even if that makes me reach deeper down side and grab something. Whereas if, if someone gives me a compliment, I would feel like I don't have anywhere to go. And it's, it's, it's like diffused. Okay, you can sit there and do nothing because you're, it's great. Well, I, I like compliments, even if a person's lying. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember that. Okay. I think I wasn't lying before. <laughs> as an artist, um, I think an artist, at least for myself, I'm my worst critic. So I'm constantly challenging. I'm constantly questioning. I'm constantly um, self-doubting. So. I get enough of that from myself. It's nice to have somebody to say I like it. Even when they turn away from you, you know, they're holding their nose. But um, so each of us are different, you know, and it's um, it's what makes art beautiful is that I think there's a, a tremendous potential within all of us. And I, it's a way of finding some form of uh, of expression and voice that maybe was hidden or maybe you know like I say it was been, you know, shoved uh, so far deep within us to protect it you know if we if we I think we protect the things that are really value to us and we if we feel they're going to be rejected we bury them to protect them and we it takes some encouragement it takes some confidence it takes some experiences to allow those things to come out and, and for the person to say, you know, this is who I am and, and be able to do that. I, I paint figures that are kind of that some were distorted and and uh, and naked. I did some things uh, like that of, uh, of nudes. And I mean, how many of us will stand naked with all our distortions and say, this is who I am, do you accept me? You know, we all, or, you know, when I say we all, I'm probably just talking about myself. We hide those. We I, I, that's hard. I, I would have a hard time doing that. But, you know, I've had models that are 
totally comfortable doing it and uh i appreciate that they can do that but yeah that is laying themselves bare and naked before us as basically every one of our paintings lay ourselves bare and naked before everybody you know so how many how many paintings will we do that will take the chance of showing who we really are or what we would really like to express or take that chance of failure or rejection in order to find out what we really are or, or maybe this is who we are but it's rejected you know so it's um you know it's a whole journey of different stages in that journey meaning different things for different people and you know, get something different each each stage of that back to them but mine is you know i'm getting older and i, I don't, don't want to leave here with my song left in me so i don't know what that song necessarily is so i'm just searching for that and, and uh you know i want to pass that along to my kids that they are in an environment here that they can try anything anything goes and, and um they're your legacy yeah they're they're my legacy they're, they're they're better painters than I am. They're more inquisitive, and, and they, you know, when I'm ready to sit down. And, you know, I like them still the best, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. So. But they're they've got that uh, potential in them, and I don't want to, I don't want to suppress that in any way. No, I could. I, you know, when I'm in front of your paintings, like I said, I just marvel at the sophistication of the paint, and I just can't really explain that unless you get up close and you look at the way the the, the paint's moving uh, and uh, I guess I, I think it's getting used to it you know I think it's getting used to the materials so if you paint long enough and just use a broom you'll learn to paint with a broom so you know I learned to paint with thicker paint because it, it took a lot to destroy something that I put down you know it wasn't delicate it wasn't uh, sensitive to it's just a little breath or something. So I think Danny is better. John's coming in the studio right now, but if you hear that, so oh one one of the things I, I haven't had it that long is my own uh, studio and uh, the thing that I've liked about having my own studio is that I've been able to have all my paintings around me. And it seems like having my paintings around me um, to look at um, I've started to learn a lot more about myself. When you look around your gallery and you see your paintings, what do you learn? Same thing as you. You're, they're like good friends that are hanging around, encouraging you to do more. And I got, I have the opportunity to see what Danny and John are doing. So there are other people saying, I'm getting feedback from them saying, hey, look at me, do something in this direction. And so that's what it is. Some are like little handicapped kids that are leaning against the wall and waiting for their turn to be helped, you know, and others are things that encourage you to keep pressing. I could have done this a little better. I could have so yeah, and I have a, we have a large studio. We have a 5,000 square foot studio. So it's a building that I bought about 14 years ago. But, so we're, we're tremendously port system here, where when you're at your own house or your own studio, uh, your own garage, your own closet. You're, you, once you fail, you, you think you, it's destructive. You think that's the end. You know, you're not an artist. Instead, here with my two sons, man, it's always encouraging. I'll oh, take another step. You know, it's one more step out of the shadow. You'll be in the sunlight. And you need that to help uh, expand your creativity. Otherwise, you just do what's safe and really unpredictable, and you get better and better at it. That holds you, that seduces you into that, that, that thing. Thinking. And that's all right, but is that your intention? Is that where your potential is? So, by having the more knowledge you have, won't keep you from being a genius. So, the more things that you can acquire to stimulate your imagination, to make you have chances, those are the things that are important for an artist. And an art grows that. Things that you didn't like in art, you know, ten years ago. Now you see some value in it. It's because your, your knowledge is expanding, your perception is expanding. Right. You're becoming more flexible and open. 
Well, Dan, I wanted to thank you. Uh, you've been so gracious to spend this time with me today and with the people that will be watching this video uh, for years to come, I'm sure. Um, you, you really are a great painter, and I, uh, and I don't have to make you feel good either. <laughs> I appreciate it. That's one of those compliments. I tend to uh, turn around and say, hey, I hate his work, but it's, you know, it's <laughs> And I, I appreciate so much you being with us here today. So thank you again. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, it was an opportunity. I appreciate it. So thank you. Right. And uh, we'll talk to you down the road.